We're in a uh, teaching series about marriage, and, and you know, I know what a lot of people say. A lot of people go, I'm not married. Well, you know what? Maybe you ought to find <laughs> no, The fact of the matter is, uh, you know, we're not all married. Uh, there's people that single. There's people that's been divorced. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, is no matter <clears throat> whether you're married or not, uh, there's going to be something that's going to be said uh, that hopefully will help you along the journey of life. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, Brother Jackie, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not married. I'm going to be married. And I said, well, you know what? Maybe you'll run into a young couple that you can give some nuggets to and kind of help them out along the journey of marriage. Marriage is a journey, can I give an amen? It's a big deal. So we're going to be talking about that. This is my wife, Denise. Uh, we've been married 44 years, y'all. Uh, we, we've been hanging out together for a long time. And this is my friend Van and Judy uh, Smith. Everybody say hey to them, y'all. Amen. Uh, we're glad that y'all are here. Van and Judy, <clears throat> you know, Every Sunday, we're, uh, we're bringing somebody up to kind of talk a little bit about marriage. And uh, uh, how long y'all been married? 48 years, going on 49 now. Wow, you said that with so much enthusiasm, Miss <laughs> Judy. You were just... God uh, is good, Brother Jack. <clears throat> he is good, amen. And uh, Denise and I have been married uh, this coming July, or no, October, good night. Uh, we've been married, uh, we've been married uh, 44 years, y'all. Uh, Denise and I got married when we were 18 years old. That's crazy, y'all. Uh, we've been knowing each other since third grade, so we've been hanging out together a long time. But uh, Van and Judy and Denise, you know, a lot of young couples, especially in today's world, uh, man, they're bombarded with all this stuff, you know, houses, cars, you know, stuff, things. Uh, did y'all have a lot of money when y'all got married? Well, you know, you're talking young. I was young. Yeah, well, you yeah. don't make the greatest decisions when you're young. Between the time I asked Miss Judy to marry me and it was time for the wedding, I wrecked my car. Oh, wow. No insurance and no money. So I went down and seen the Mr. Man at the bank. And he didn't know me, but he knew my daddy. And he said, well, man, you getting married? A man needs credit when he's getting married. <laughs> now, Brother Jackie, I, that man knows what he's talking about. Yes, he I did. Mean, Amen. The credit <clears throat> didn't stop. Yeah. But uh, we lived out of the trunk of that car for about three years, and then the Lord blessed us, and we just made our payments right on to I got you. So you had to go get some money to get your car out of hock. Well, I needed to, to get my car. I needed to get my suit clean. I needed to buy the license, and I needed $10 for the preacher. Wow, man. Wow. <laughs> you did get a deal, man. Uh, $10 for the, huh? High price preacher, man, 10 bucks. Uh, yeah, you know, you start off like that, and you know, you, you, you look at life and money, and you think, oh my gosh, you know, when you're in love, a lot of times you don't think about the money thing. What about us, baby? What do you think? Well, we had a repo trailer that was pretty old, and um, we had uh, nothing. Yeah, we did. A little bitty triangle piece of land that that trailer sat on that, praise God, we didn't have to pay for. And um, we had a TV that was a $20 payment. We had a trailer that was $89.90 something payment and another payment that was $90 something dollars for a car. It's bad when your car is a bigger payment than your trailer. That tells you something. <laughs> yes, it does. But, um, <clears throat> you know, when we first got married, the first six years that we were married, um, I worked outside the home and um, did the money. So Jay would bring his money home, and how many of you know the term you borrow from Peter to pay Paul and beat the bank? So you send a check in and you pray that you beat the bank before that check goes through? We got good at that, y'all. <laughs> well, every week I would do that. I would know what to pay this week so I could pay that next week. And every week Jackie would argue, where's all my money? So <laughs> Where's the money? I told him one day, I said, look, if you're going to argue with me, you're going to fight with me, you're going to do the money. I'm not doing it anymore. And he said... No, nah, yes, you're going to do the money. So I gave him the checkbook. And after a couple of weeks, he comes back and says, how did you do that? Well, it, you ladies that take care of the money, you know how you do that. Well, then after um, it was the after six years, our first daughter was born. 
And I'd always said when we have kids, they're going to be raised in church. And so um, we started the church. We totally dedicated our lives to the Lord. And the Lord, um, from that point, Jackie and I would sit and we'd pray and do our money together. And I don't have to worry, didn't have to worry about the money. And that was a blessing because, you know, um, it's all God's anyway. And if you don't give it to him, pay attention in your life how many flat tires you have, how many washers you have to dry, you have to buy, um, how many refrigerators go out on you. It's his money, so he's going to, it's going to go if you don't give it to him. Or you could be faithful and be blessed and have whatever you want, pretty much. And that's the end of the message today. Let's take up an offering. And uh, wow, you know, <clears throat> we, uh, Denise and I fought a lot uh, in marriage. Uh, we, we just fight over money. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't look at your spouse, but can I get an amen? Uh, we'd be fighting over that stuff, you know, money all the time. Where, where's the money going, man? We got my money, uh, you know. And uh, then when she handed me that checkbook and she goes, no, you do it with that look. Anybody know that look you get? And uh, I'm thinking, I don't want this check, but man, I, I just want to fuss about it. So we'd fuss about money and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times young couples start off, uh, you know, battling that stuff, battling finances and, and all that stuff. And so, uh, Van and Judy, thanks for coming up and hanging out with me, baby doll. I'll see you in a little bit. Love y'all. Hey, y'all let them know you appreciate them today. God's good. Amen. <clears throat> uh, 40, 40 something years, uh, you know, y'all said y'all were married 40, how many years, Judy? 48 years. Denise and I have been married 44 years. And, and I think it's important for a lot of our young couples that come uh, to know that, hey, you know what? We can make it, you know, because uh, a lot of young couples, they fight over money too. And marriage uh, is, has its ups and it has its downs. It has its good times and it has its challenges. And, and we're just here today to kind of talk to you honestly and truly about the challenges you all face because every one of us face challenges and we all go through these tough times in life. And so what we want to do is we want to, in this series, we want to kind of be real with y'all and just talk to you right up front. And, and you know what? Not, not come across the wrong way, but just kind of tell you we're people just like y'all are, and uh, we're going to talk about that today. So are y'all ready? Can I get an amen? Let's all stand and lift our Bibles up, guys, and let's say it together. You know what to do? We're in the house of God today, guys, and we're going to lift up the Bible. Here we go. This is my Bible. It is trustworthy and true. Right now, my mind is alert, my heart is humble, and my spirit is teachable. I will listen, I will learn, and I will live the principles taught in this book. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Let's bow together and pray. Father, we're so grateful today that we can come in your presence, God. And we thank you, God, that yes, life is filled up with challenges. And, and, and Lord, we all battle through that. But God, we're so grateful today that you're on your throne. And Lord, uh, that we can trust you. And I pray, God, that <clears throat> as we come together, as we think about this, that there's a lot of couples that battle this stuff. And I pray, God, uh, that you will help them in this. So God, give me wisdom to speak to them, and I pray, Lord, that you allow me to speak not for a big name or a reputation, Mom, but God, all the glory and all the praise would go to Jesus, for it's in his name we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm so ready to learn, y'all. I'm so ready to learn. Uh, we're presently in a Bible teaching series called Making Marvelous Marriages. Now, uh, I, I, we started this last Sunday, y'all. And last Sunday, we talked about how do you build that strong foundation? How do you get started right? Uh, because the Bible tells us if you build on sand, the storms are going to come and the wind's going to blow and the rain's going to fall and the house will fall. But if you build your home and your house on the rock, uh, the storms will come and, and man you'll be able to you'll kind of be able to navigate through that and, and you will have a strong marriage and so today uh, what I want to do is kind of shift our mind a little bit rather than talking about the foundation in the marriage uh, today I want to talk about finances in a marvelous marriage in the first service uh, somebody stopped me after they uh, looked at the title and they said brother Jack you ought to change the title today rather than finances in a marvelous marriage maybe the title ought to be the lack of finances in a marvelous marriage. And I think that all of us uh, could probably 
uh, relate to that in one way or another. Uh, you know, when Denise and I got married, I just want to kind of be real with y'all today and let you know that we're just transparent people. We're just like you are. Uh, we struggled in things in our life. We still do. Uh, we didn't come from rich families, guys. Uh, Denise and I both came from poor families. We didn't have anything. Uh, you know, we, our family didn't have money. And so when we got married, uh, you know, we, we went in this marriage thing. I mean, we, you know, we were blinded by love, y'all. You know, we thought, Oh, man, we can live off love. How many of you know love will not put food on the table, right? And so uh, we started our marriage together. I remember when Denise and I got married, I had, are y'all going to be so proud of me, y'all? I had saved, are y'all ready for this? We were going to say, I do, and we're going to get married. And I had myself saved a whopping $200. Uh, you know, I just thought, man, we're, she's marrying a rich guy here. I mean, I got $200. And then I went to buy the, we didn't, I didn't buy an engagement ring. We didn't have the money to do that. Uh, so we went down to the jewelry store and we bought two wedding bands. Well, after we paid for the wedding bands, I had $79 left. And we started our journey uh, with $79. I told her we got married on a promissory note. That's what we did. And, and so we, we really got married. And you know what? We didn't have... We, we, We'd, uh, I didn't know I was going to be a preacher. I had no clue about that. I was a heathen man. And so, uh, you know, we get married and we're just working. We got a, we got a trailer that, that's a third-handed trailer. We got a TV with a $20 TV note. And... Um, and man, we're going to work, and I'm, I can remember thinking, man, if I can just make ten more dollars, I'll be able to. Man, we're going to make it. You know, we're going to survive. And I remember, uh, you know, every week thinking, man, if I just, if I could, if they just give me a raise to help me make ten more dollars, I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll be okay. But every week, man, at the end of the week, we were struggling, and we were battling, and so uh, what she said was true. Uh, she was doing the checkbook. Now, I know a lot of y'all don't know what a checkbook is, right? Because a lot of young people today, how many of y'all still know what a checkbook is? Anybody in here still write a check? How many of y'all don't write checks no more? I mean, you, you know, uh, my daughters don't write checks. They pull that on me all the time. They, they use debit cards, and we go out to eat, and they go, Dad, we ain't got no cash on me. Will you, will you take care of everything? But the fact of the matter is people today don't use cash they don't write checks they just got debit cards and all that stuff well in our day we wrote checks and and man she'd write the checks you know I let her do it like like a real man would and I'd say you you write you handle the money I'm gonna be the guy that's gonna make the money I'm gonna bring the money in you write the checks well she'd write the checks and after she'd write the checks man it just ticked me off I'm telling you I'd be mad on a wet hand and I'm thinking where's all this money where's my money going I mean I made a whopping eighty seven dollars this week good night uh, what where did, where did that go and uh, we would fight y'all we would fight I mean we'd fight and we'd battle and we'd struggle and she'd say you know what you do the money I go no I don't want to do the money you, you, you just you're wasting things and she'd, she'd boy we'd fight back and forth and, and then she'd say I'm not doing it no more you know I'm just not going to do it no more you do it so I would take the checkbook. Man, I'd do it for about a day, and I'm saying, I ain't doing this. I'm giving it back to her. And we'd fight about that. <clears throat> and, man, we battled so much, and we struggled, and we went, you know, we, we tried to climb that financial mountain, and we didn't have no money. Uh, we, we didn't know what to do. Uh, we were struggling. How many of y'all know you get a lot more month, at, you have a lot more at the end of the month than you do money? Can I get an amen? And you're thinking, how are we going to pay the power bill? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? So we've been there, y'all. Uh, we've, we've navigated through that. And I remember, you know, we did all that. We fall all through that. And or when we were in our early 20s, y'all, uh, we, we went to church. My dad kept on hounding at me to go to church, just kept on driving me nuts. You got to go to church. You got to go to church. I was saved when I was 12 years old, but I, I hate to admit this. I got saved when I was 12 years old, but I'm just going to tell you something. I got fire insurance, but I didn't know how. I was not sold out to Jesus. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so when I got saved, man, I knew I wasn't going to go to hell, but I wasn't living the way I should so we got married 18 years old right out of high school got married man you know we wasn't in church my dad would drive me nuts go to church go to church and finally he came by the house told us to go to church I looked at her and I said let's go so he'll shut up I just want to get him off my back we went to church God began to deal with me I didn't know I was going to be a preacher, uh, and uh, I, God called me to preach, and you know, I didn't know all that in the beginning, man, I sat on the back row of a church trying to hide, that's what I was doing, and so uh, we went to church, and after, after we'd been there a while, we made this decision, we're going to make Jesus really Lord of our life. 
Uh, we're, we're really going to sell out to this Jesus thing. We're going we're gonna to commit our life to, to the Lord. We're going to be in church. We're just going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this, church, this Jesus thing the way it should be done. And she looked at me, and she said this to me, and I could not believe she was this dumb. She said to me, we're going to tithe. And I said, you are crazy. We can't pay our bills. Uh, we're not going to tithe. She said, yes, we are. And I said, no, we're not. She said, yes, we are. And I said, no, we're not. And then she got that woman look on her face and said, yes, we are. And I said, okay, but you're going to find out we're going we're to starve to death. We're, you know, you do it. You go ahead and do it, but we're going to starve to death. Now, guys, listen to me. I'm telling you straight up. That was a long time ago. And, and I'm going to tell you, God's always took care of us when we put him first. So you know what? After we started doing that, I can't explain it. I don't know how to tell you this, but God started honoring what he said we'd do in our life. And I want to tell you young people this and young couples this. I know that you're strapped. I know you've got a lot of financial obligations. You've got all kinds of things going on. But if you leave God out of your life, you're going to be, you're going to be struggling all your life. You're, you're going you're gonna to do it all by yourself, and you're going to find out that what you can do is not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna take care of you. You don't need what you can do, you need what God can do. And I promise you, I could say this day, everybody that, that believes that, stand up, there'd be hundreds of people that stood up that said, you know what, Brother Jack, you're telling them the truth. So I'm not telling you this, people go, well, we're gonna go to church, you're gonna talk about finances so the preacher can get money and the church get money, look at me. I'm, tr I'm, I'm transparent with you. That is not what I'm after. I'm not, I don't say for y'all to hold your hand up over the offer plate so the church can get a lot of money. That's not what this is about. I want you to be blessed. And I know that God will bless you if you honor him. But if you try to build your marriage on this, on this thing and you don't know how to handle your finances, you're always going to be in trouble. You're always going to be struggling all your life and battling this all your life. I think we all would agree that in, we're in the wealthiest country in the world, but we're battling money problems in most marriages. Uh, we, I want you to know today that I will, uh, I'll be speaking to you from my heart. I will not tell you anything, and I want you to hear me. I won't tell you anything to lead you astray. My daughters are here. I told them the same thing, man. Uh, you know, I, want, I, want, I taught my kids the same thing. I'm going to teach my grandkids the same thing. I'm not telling you anything that I would not tell my daughters or my kids or my son-in-laws. I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell them. Are you with me? Say amen. So when I think about this, I want to read something to you before we dive in today. And I think that before I read this, I think that when you talk about money, there are a lot of subtitles with big ideas. For example, like income and outgo and inflation and financial planning and financial success and investments and uh, debt and retirement and stewardship, and the list goes on and on and on. So when we talk about this thing called finances, you have to understand this, that I've been studying the Bible a long time, and did you know that God has more to say about finances than he does about heaven or hell? And when you start reading your Bible and you start opening it up to the, to the Word of God, God wants to direct you in the air of your finances. So we, we think about pre-approved pre -approved credit cards and a few dollars down and a few dollars a week and zero down with no credit check and going out of business. This is your last chance to get this item. Easy credit, get rich quick, lotteries, gambling, and all that stuff. Everybody wants to have money and they really want their finances to be secure, but they don't know how to do it right. So see if this story kind of relates to where you are. Jill was beside herself. She had delayed the task as long as possible, but she had to face paying the monthly bills. The balances on both major credit cards were to their max. The department store bills were multiplying. The bank statement included charges for two overdrafts. There was a late notice for the house payment. There seemed to be no hope in sight. The usual questions ran through Jill's mind. How did she and her husband acquire so much debt? What did they have to show for their hard-earned money? What would they do in case of an emergency? Would they uh, have another hurtful argument about money and who's to blame? Who would, how are we ever going to pay our bills off? And Jill uh, prayed silently as she saw her husband drive up in the driveway as she sat there being anxious over her dilemma lord what can we do what can we do have you ever been there have you ever been at that place that you're saying god 
I don't know what to do. We're in over our heads. We don't know where to do. We don't know where to turn. And when I think about that, I believe that there are so many people that in our church and around our world that's struggling. Struggling financially. And it's almost as if, especially you young, you young people, you know, you look at us, we've been on the couch and we were talking about, uh, we've been married 44 years, they've been married 48 years. And I think that, you know, over time we've had, we've acquired things and all that stuff, but I think the mindset for a lot of young people is that you get married today, you have a gigantic house tomorrow, you have uh, all these new cars and boats and things and stuff, and you get in over your head. And then all of a sudden you, you start realizing, man, we got marital problems because we are in over our heads financially. So when I begin to think about that, I want you to take your Bible and open it up to the book of Deuteronomy. Are you with me? Say amen. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to look there together today as we study under the sermon title, Finances in a Marvelous Marriage. Now, I want you to open your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. We begin to realize that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17, this is what you all need to hear. Okay, so here we go. Verse 17, and thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me wealth. Let's stop there for a minute. Let's read that out loud together, everybody. Come on, help me, y'all. And thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me wealth. You know what that verse means, guys? That's a person that looks at their life and says, you know what, I did this. It's my money, I worked hard, my hard-earned labor, by the sweat of my brow, I got this. It's by my power, by my hand, I get up every day and I go to work and I make my money. And because of that, that's my money. And I'm going to tell you, if you think like that, you're way off base. It's not your money. So let's look at verse 18 together today. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto his fathers as it is this day. And it shall be that if you forget God, y'all, if you forget God and you walk after other gods and you serve them and you worship them, I testify against you this day, you will surely perish. You know what that means? That means that if you leave God out of your life and you leave God out of your finances and you're thinking, man, we, we, it's all mine. I worked hard. I earned it. The Bible says that, you, listen, you don't even have the ability without God, you don't have the ability to get up in, out of your bed. You don't have the ability to give yourself the next heartbeat. You cannot give yourself the next breath that you get. Can I get an amen? If God's not blessing you, you can't even get out of the bed to go to work. So guys, listen to me. It's not you that gets this stuff. God gives you the ability to do it. And if God gives you your heart beating, God gives you your breath, and God gives you the strength to get out of the bed, but if you forget him, if you forget him and you start worshiping stuff and things and houses and cars and things like that, then God says, you know what? You're going to perish. You're going to perish. Now, now, let's look at Proverbs quickly. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. And everybody would say, yes, amen, Brother Jack. I love chapter 3 and verse number 5 and verse number 6. Rock on, Pastor. That's the verses I like. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will do what? Direct your path. Look at the next. Be, no, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil, and it shall be health to your mar mar navel and marrow to your bones. Honor the Lord. Everybody say that with me. What? Honor the Lord. With your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. What does that mean, y'all? It means that even in your money, even in your finances, you're supposed to honor God first. When Denise and I get money in our house, uh, when we get money that comes in our house, the very first thing we do, y'all, is we sit down and I grab her hand and we pray. And we say, God, this is your money. You blessed us, Lord. And we, we together, guys, listen to me. Grab your wife by the hand and remind her. You know what? Without God, we wouldn't get anything. And I grab my wife by the hand and we pray and we say, God, this is yours. Help us to use this wisely. The very first check we write out is not our mortgage payment. The very first check we write out is not to the power company. 
The very first thing we do is we write God our tithe check because we know that if we honor God, God will honor us. And, and you know what? When you honor God that way, you say, well, Brother Jack, I can't afford it. Let me tell you something. You can't afford not to do it that way. You have to realize, and the Bible says that when you do that, your barns will be filled with plenty. Your presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, I, I guarantee you, everybody in here would say, Brother Jack, we, we, want, we want to be blessed. Do you want to be blessed if you do? Raise your hand and say, praise the Lord. I want to be blessed. Well, how do you get blessed? Do you get blessed by robbing God? Do you get blessed in your marriage by stealing from God? No. You have to do it God's way. And if you leave God out of the equation, you're going to mess up your marriage and you're going to be in trouble and you're going to struggle and battle all the days of your life. So I want to give you a couple of things today. Uh, look at verse number 10. Uh, go on to verse number 10. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your press is going to burst out with new wine. In other words, God will bless you. God will take care of you. So today I'm going to give you a couple of quick things for you to think about in way of your finances. Are you with me? Say amen. The first thing that we got to do, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna be blessed in our marriages and we're gonna be blessed in our families, we gotta recognize what the problem is. You know, a lot of people say, well, Brother Jackie, we wanna, we wanna be blessed and we wanna fix this, but they're not willing to recognize what is the problem. So I'm gonna kinda, though many couples are in financial bondage and have serious money problems, uh, that those money problems are tearing their marriages apart. They're often ignorant of the true causes of the difficulty and they're unable to deal with the root of the situation. Most couples see that their problem is too little income to meet their needs. They believe that if they only had more money, they would be able to overcome their problems. But these problems that they're dealing with are, root, are coming from a root problem that is deeper than a lack of income in their life. So I'm gonna give you three things quickly. First of all, Problems of behavior. Problems of behavior. The first thing that we got to recognize is, man, when we want to deal with our financial issues, we have to ask ourselves, what is, what is my behavior toward money? What is this? Now, this is not going to be on the notes, but you need to write this down. The problems of behavior like irresponsibility, just write that down. It's true that most income problems is not a lack of money, but a lack of, of how to handle their money responsibly. Uh, you know, they, uh, they incur debt that they don't need. Just write that down, they incur debt. Purchasing goods such as cars and furniture and clothing and all this stuff, using installments or credit cards drastically causes you problems. So if you're irresponsible in your behavior and you're just buying stuff and you're just continually just putting that on your financial load, you're going to be in trouble. Interest that's carrying charges and all that stuff. And you know, you, you have to realize that, that you don't need to do that. You don't need to impulse. You don't need to uh, incur debt in your life. Look at me, guys. Look at me. Look at me. If you're in a hole... And, and, and you're in a hole financially, why would you keep digging? Somebody said to me that one time, they said, Brother Jack, I, I just feel like I'm, I'm in a hole and I can't get out. I said, throw the shovel away. You just keep digging your hole, dip. Every, every decision you make is a bad decision. So, so before we look at the next one, impulse buying. That's another thing when we think about when we think about irresponsibility. People just buy on the impulse. I gotta have that car. I gotta have that. I gotta have that dress. I gotta have that blouse. I, I just gotta have it. You just walk in a store and it's there, and you just man, you just gotta have it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, when you're impulse buying, you're going, you're digging your hole. And I'm gonna tell you, I, I got a problem with the way people do it today, anyway. Especially with the young people, man, they're setting y'all up for a crash. Because you know what? You ain't got no money. You don't carry money on y'all. You don't carry money. You just swipe it. Man, you walk in, man, you want something, there it is, bam, I got to swipe the card. Can I tell you something? It's, it's a little bit more difficult to let go of that 20 than it is swiping on cards. Can I give an amen? Impulse buy. Now, none of y'all are guilty of that. Are you? Are anybody here guilty of that? You just walk in, gotta have it, gotta have it. I mean, look at me. How many more blouses do you need? How many more Alabama hats do you guys need? 
You know, just go, oh my gosh, I just got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. Impulse buying, it's got to have it, got to have it. How many of y'all got more junk around your house than you need? Anybody? And look, listen, man, and I'm, we're guilty of it too. Good night, we buy stuff, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we got stuff. Why are we going to buy more stuff? And then, here's the mindset of how we are today. We go buy stuff, and then we have a yard sale, and we sell it for a fraction of what we sold it for, and then we say, oh, I made $20 at the yard sale. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It don't work that way. And then lack of diligence. You know, people just don't know how to manage themselves and money. You know, you look at this thing, and you go, oh, my gosh. So when you look at irresponsibility, and I want you to write that down right after that point number eight, irresponsibility. We just are irresponsible. The Bible says in 24, Proverbs 24, it says, I went by the field of a slothful man, and the vineyard of a man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall was therefore was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well, and I looked upon it, and I received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so your poverty will come on you as one that travaileth and thy want as an armed man. In other words, you know, when you think about this, you have to be responsible. Can I tell y'all something? Y'all listen to me say amen? amen. If, you're, if, you, if you listen to me, we're living in a world today to where people seem to think they're entitled to everything. Watch this. Write this down. Go to work. Get a job. People say, well, Brother Jack, you know, I, I just don't have no money. Go get a job. And people, I'm not working for that. I don't know where y'all came from, but in Brompton, where I came from, $2 is better than no money. Can I get an amen? People, I ain't working. I ain't working for $10. I ain't doing that. Boy, you'll stay at home and not make anything. Are you kidding me? Go to work. Yeah, listen, if you need more money, get another job. Go to two jobs. It's not going to kill you to work. Can I get an amen? amen. Lord, help me. Don't get me started. <laughs> Think a good night, man. Just get a job. You know, I, I, we're living in a world today to where people think, oh, everybody's supposed to support them. You know, I think that there are people that certainly, uh, that, that certainly can't do that, but good night. You know, go, 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 go ask somebody, can I, can I cut your grass? Can I clean out your barn? Can I tote your sticks? Can I, can I dig a ditch? Can I, can I, what can I do to make some money? You've got to be responsible, y'all. Responsible. Uh, you know, I, there, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. Somebody stopped me the other day. And I, they're not here, so y'all don't be looking at them. They stopped me and said, oh, I need some money. My, I got to. I got to get. My daughter just got put in the hospital at UAB down down Birmingham. I ain't got no gas money. I need some money. Can you give me some money? Look at me. While they was asking me for money, they was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> now I don't know where y'all come from, but where I come from, I'm thinking, how much do cigarettes cost? Now I'm not saying cigarettes will send you to hell, but I will tell you it makes you smell like you already been there, so it's no big deal with me. <laughs> Good night. You ain't got no gas money, but you're paying seven bucks for a pack of cigarettes. And you're smoking three packs a day. Are you kidding me? And you want to ask me to give you some money. Look, you got to be responsible with this thing. You know, quit drinking. You know, if I, if I, if I, if I wanted to have some gas money, I quit drinking. I don't drink, so y'all don't think I'm going to quit. But I'm thinking, good night. Quit drinking Dr. Pepper's. Spend, listen, be responsible with your money. Can I get an amen? amen? And then I want you to notice this, insensitivity. The problem of irresponsibility in, in many money managers is often compounded by the fact that the spouse makes the purchase without even consideration of their other, the spouse that they're married to or the kids. Like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get whatever I want even though we ain't got no groceries in the house. You know, that's insensitive. How about this? Before you buy, why don't you talk about stuff? Can we afford this? I mean, you've got to be sensitive to each other. 
And then the third thing, write this down, uh, ignorance. People just don't know how to manage money. They, they don't know how to do it. And it's not, the ignorance word is not a bad thing. It's just that a lot of people, don't, they, don't, they don't know how to, uh, they don't know how to plan. They don't know how to set up a budget. They, they don't know how to do all this. Can I tell y'all something? When you listen to me, say amen. You know, you're going to die one day. You've got to have money for a funeral. You've got to have, a, if you're going to get in a casket, you've got to have a casket. Folks say, I ain't worried about that. That's somebody else's problem. How, how, ir- how, how bad is that? When we got married, Denise and I got married, my mom and dad and her mom and dad made us buy, buy cemetery lots. I'm thinking, dear God, I just got married. You want me to buy a cemetery lot? And they were just teaching me and Denise that, hey, you know what? you got to be responsible. You know what? You, if you grow up and, and you have kids and you're not planned and, and, and what if something happens to you? You're gonna, you mean you're going to put that on your kids? That they got to pay for your own funeral? And then don't do that. So they made, made us buy cemetery lots. I've been married three weeks, and they're telling me, I've got an appointment for you to buy cemetery lots. I'm thinking, what, they know something I don't know. <laughs> but I'm so grateful that they helped me with that because they taught me that I need to plan. You know, I, I need to plan things. Uh, we got this thing in our church. It's called the five Ps. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. What does that mean? That means we've got to think out there a little bit. Some people just live their life and never think about tomorrow. They go buy all this junk, but they don't think about the power bill at the end of the month. They don't think about, oh my gosh, we we got a house payment. You have to think about that stuff. And then I want you to notice just point number two, problems of attitude. You know, the attitude is very important in how we manage our finances. Now, I, I could just track a lot with this, but I'm just going to give you two. First of all, the attitude, wrong attitude about happiness. A lot of people think that things will make them happy. Like if I get a new car, I'll be happy. Or if I get a new house, I'll be happy. Or if I get this, I'll be happy. How many of you realize a new car don't stay new very long at all? And all of a sudden, the new wears off. My mom and daddy used to tell me, son, before you go buy something, before you just go buy something, Don't go buy it, wait two weeks. And if you want it after the two weeks, then you need to count the cost if you really want it or not. I'm going to tell you all, honestly, there's a lot of times that I was going to buy something and I waited two weeks and I thought, I don't want that. You know, things don't make you happy. You can have all kinds of things and it's just not going to make you happy. I think that in the world that we live in today, a lot of our young people have got strapped into this thinking, man, if, if I can get all the designer clothes or I can get the new house or I can get the new car, man, I, we'll just be happy. You know, I've learned the more you get, the more problems you got. So in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, it says, He said to him, be, take heed, beware of covetous. Read this with me, everybody. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Your life is not about stuff. You say, well, I'm just, if, I'm, you know, if I get a lot of stuff, I'll be happy. Can I just tell you this? It won't work for you. The stuff's not going to make you happy. You know, that's just not going to give you what you're looking for. And then secondly, watch this, the attitude, of, the wrong attitude about money. And we're living in a world today to where people's got their own conclusions about money. But we remind ourselves in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money. There's a lot of people that love money. And if, if you love money, it's the root of all evil, which some have coveted after. And the Bible goes on and says, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, there's a lot of people that they, they don't attend church. They don't, they don't, they don't, they're not going to be in here. Why? Because they're trying to get more stuff. You know, they, 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 they put all that. I've heard people say, man, when we, get our, when we get our finances in order, when we get all this in order, then we'll start being faithful in church. No, you're not. Because what happens is you've got the wrong attitude about money. See, it's not that it's wrong to have money. It's wrong that money has you. So we look at the next scripture and it says like this. Let's all read this together, everybody. 
For no man can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other. For else he will hold the one and despise the other. Come on now. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Money. When you make money your master, then it draws you away from God. And when you got the wrong attitude about money, you're in trouble. So let's realize some principles real quick. Just some quick principles that you need to nail down and have before you leave here today. Are y'all okay? Say amen. amen. Let's put it all in perspective before we leave today, especially our young people. I want you to get this, man. I want to help you with this. The first thing that you have to do is understand the principle of ownership. The principle of ownership. You say, well, we own this. No, you don't. If you think you own something, try dying. Try dying. You don't own anything. You don't own anything. The Bible says in Psalms 24, verse number 1, read it out loud, everybody. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Who owns the earth, y'all? Let me ask you a question. Are you with me? Where does cars come from? I know what y'all thinking, Lincoln, Alabama. Before I, before I got my Honda, some of y'all thinking, Japan. All right, listen to me, look at me. Who makes the steel? Where does steel come from to make the car? It comes from the earth. Where does rubber come from to put on the tires? Where, where does plastic come from? Everything that makes up some substance comes from the earth. Where does gold come from? Where does silver come from? Who owns the earth? God does. We don't own anything. If it wasn't for God owning the earth, we wouldn't have anything. We're not here to own anything. We're here to steward what God does own. So we realize then that God owns it all. I know the, all the fowls of the mountains, God owns them. God owns all the beasts of the field. They're his. Uh, if, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, says God, and the fullness. That, what is God saying? He's saying, I own everything. I own all the earth. I own all the people on earth. I own all, I own all the birds of the air. I own all the, the beasts of the field. I own all the cows. I own all the chickens. I own all, everything you eat. I own everything that grows. I own, I own everything on the earth. That belongs to God. Now look at the next verse. Because the silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord. So when you think about it, what do you really own? Nothing. God owns what? Everything. So if you're going to be able to start somewhere managing your finances, you have to realize you don't own your money. God does. All right, now, now that's important to know. So we understand that, that God owns it all. Now there's a book, I wanna, I've said this a couple of weeks, there's a book by David Green called Giving It All Away. And in that book, David Green, who is the owner of Hobby Lobbies, says these words, my mother taught me that 90 is greater than 100. Now, mathematically, that doesn't sound correct. You may want to write that down, 90 is greater than 100. What his mama was teaching David Green was, you can do more with the 90 that you have left after you give God your 10 percent than you could ever do with the 100 that, that you keep. In other words, 90 is greater than 100 because when you honor God, God will honor you. Now, we realize then that the principle of ownership, but let's think about the principle of giving, the principle of giving. I teach my girls this. I've taught them this all their life. I, my son-in-law is my, I want to teach our grandkids this. Give to God. Listen, I don't want, my, I don't want to just give a tithe because everybody gets hung up on that. More churches, all they want is our money. Are you kidding me? Listen to me. Look at me. I don't. The tithe is the floor of giving, not the ceiling of giving. I want me and my family to be so blessed that we give above a tithe. That we're not just giving a tithe; we're giving an offering on top of that. I want our family to be so blessed of God that we're not regulated by going. Oh, we're just going to tithe. No, I don't want my family just to be a tither. I want to be a giver. I want them to go beyond the tithe. 
And there's a principle of giving. Look at what it says in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your substance. Come on now, help me. And with the first fruits of what? All your increase. Do you do that? Honor the Lord with your substance and all your increase. That's why I tell y'all, seriously, I'm telling you the truth. In our house every week, we join hands, we pray, and we go, God, this is your money. This doesn't belong to us. This is your money. If we're blessed, we say the same thing. God, you blessed us with this. this is your bl- you blessed us. This is your money. Now, God, we, now, me and Denise are joining hands, and we're holding hands together, and we say this. God, help us to have the wisdom to use this in such a way that it will glorify you. We don't own this money. We don't own this stuff. We just want to honor you with it. And what I've learned is that if, you, if God can't trust you with $10, why would he want to give you $100? If you're going to rob him with $10, why would, why would people go, people that don't give, people that don't understand this, uh, they go, man, you know what? Well, if I could just get some more money, I'd be a tither. Why would God want to bless you with more money when you rob him with the little that you got? Why would God want to promote you to another level if he can't trust you at the level that you're at? So you begin to realize that there is a principle of giving. And the Bible says that you're to honor God with not some of your substance, but with all of your substance. And then he says in that next verse that your barns will be filled. And your, your, you'll be filled with plenty. And your wines will burst out with new wine. And you're, in other words, you're going to have life in your finances. You're going to be blessed of God. You say, Brother Jackie, how do you know that? Because, look, I had to learn that. When Anise and I gave our life to the Lord, not knowing I was going to be a preacher, had no clue of that. And she looked at me and go, okay, boss, we sold out to God. We're sitting in the pew just like you guys were. I didn't know I was going to be a preacher. She going, we're going to tithe. And I went, no, we're not. Yeah, we are. No, we're not. Yeah, we are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Okay. And I'm thinking, okay then I have to trust him. And I'm just going to tell you straight up, we come from poor, poor homes and poor families. God's never let us down. God's never disappointed us. God's never, never, never caused a problem like that. How many of y'all believe that God has a heaven prepared for you when you get there? If you can trust him with heaven, why can't you trust him with earth? If you can trust him with your soul, Why can't you trust him with your finances? You see, the same God that's promised you heaven is the same God that will take care of you if you honor him. I want my kids to know that. I want my grandkids to know that. So when we think about this, then there is the principle of giving and then the principle of contentment. We need to learn to be content that we don't have to have everything. We don't have to have the newest gadget. We don't have to have the newest car. We don't have to have the biggest house. We don't have to have the newest clothes. We don't have to do all that, y'all, because how many of y'all know that just puts us in bondage? That's all that does. There comes a point in time where you have to be content, where where you're not regulated in your life by all this stuff. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Someone talked to me this week and they said, Brother Jackie, the series that you taught on contentment changed my life. Thank you, Pastor, for teaching us how to be content. The next verse says it this way, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and my crown, Paul says, stand fast in the Lord. Be, be, be making sure that you're content in God, not in the stuff and the things and all the stuff the world has to offer. You want to have your, your value in God, not the clothes you wear, not the car you drive, not the house you live in, but rather your value is in God, knowing that you can be content in Him. And He's good enough. Can I get an amen? amen. And then I want you to notice the reorganization of your priorities. And I believe that this is so important, y'all. And I'm going to give it to you very quickly that you got to get your priorities in order. And I think so many times our priorities get out of order and we start sinking in our finances and our marriage. 
But if you get your priorities in order, and if you don't listen to anything else I tell you, listen to what I'm about to tell you. What I'm about to tell you is not words from Brother Jack, it's words from God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, let's all read it together. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. You know what that says? Put God first. Put God first. If you will put God first, then God will add these things to you. What do we normally do there? What do we normally do, y'all? Truthfully, honestly, we put things first. And when we put things first, things get us. We put God on the back shelf. I talk to people all the time. I talk to young people all the time, and I say this to them. And I want you young folks to lean and listen to me. Look, look at me. I'm almost 62 years old. I know I don't look it. Good looking guy. But here's the deal. I've been where you've been. I've walked where you've walked. I ain't always been the, behind the pulpit. I started off sweeping the floor in a fab shop. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to struggle and to battle and to do all. I know what it's like to fight with your wife over money. I know that. I get that. I've been there. I've walked in that place. I know what it's like to impulse buy. God knows I do. One night, me and Denise, we had a couple kids. We had, well, I know Stephanie was born. We decided one night we was going to go to McDonald's, and there was only one McDonald's around in Irondale. Anybody remember that? We thought, because I thought, man, we can go get a cheeseburger and a fish sandwich and we can spend five bucks and we could. We went there. I had $10 to my name. We went there and they was having a tent sale in the in parking lot of Kmart with cars. Y'all remember when they bring all them cars down there to Kmart? Put them under a tent, sell them? I went to get a fish sandwich at McDonald's in Irondale. Stopped by that tent sale and bought a new car with $10 in my pocket. They talked me into the fact I could not live the rest of my life without this car. Bought a car. How many of y'all think I needed to do that? Then we brought the thing home, and we're looking at each other thinking, what in this world did we just do? We can't even pay the power bill. We went and bought a new car. That's the dumbest thing we've ever done in our life. And I thought, good night. We struggled, y'all. We've been there. We know what it's like to make dumb choices. We know what it's like to make bad decisions. We know what it's like to not have any money. And if I, if I, was, if I, was, if I was to tell you something that wasn't true, then I would stand before God one day, give an account of that. But this is what I tell young couples. Put God first. When you put God first in your life and in your marriage, and you say, God, every spending decision is a spiritual decision. And all of a sudden you begin to realize that you put God first, and then all these things will be added to you. I'd rather get it from God than anywhere else. Can I get an amen? Because what God will do is if you'll put him first in life, I'm telling you, I'm a living example of this. If you'll put him first in your life, when it's right, he'll give you other things. When you can manage a blessing, he'll bless you with it. When you can handle a promotion, he'll promote you. But if you're trying to do it all on your own, you're just going to set yourself up for failure. See, there's principles you've got to learn. And the priority is the proper order of expenditures. You know, you got to know how to do your money. You know, don't go buy junk before you pay your power bill. Don't go buy things that you don't need before you buy your groceries. Don't, don't go spend your money on stuff and leave God out of your life. There's a proper order of expenditures. 
There's people that go waste all their money on all this stuff, and then they go, we don't have no money. Well, get the proper order. Set up a budget. Make sure you operate that way. And that's the next thing is pro practical operations for expenditure. Get a budget in your home. Don't overdo it. Make sure that you regulate what you're doing by, by some proper operations. You know, if, if, you, if you struggle, and boy, this is worth something. Y'all write this down. If you struggle with credit cards, if you, if, you, if you struggle with that, look at me. Do plastic surgery on them. Just cut them up. Take the scissors and cut them up. It's better for you to cut them up than it is for you to keep digging your hole. Take the scissors and do plastic surgery on, on those things and say, you know what? This thing, is a, this thing is a lure that gets me in trouble. Get rid of it. Cut it up. Get rid of it. Stick to a budget. Make yourself do it. Put God first and set your budget up where you don't overspend. And then finally, the question is, have you made Jesus king and Lord over every area of your life? Have you made Jesus king and Lord over every area of your life? See, that's the big question to me. A lot of people go, well, you know, I made him Lord over my prayer life. I made him Lord over, you know, these things. But what about your wallet? What about your purse? What about your finances? Have you said to God, God, I'm going to make you Lord over every area of my life, even my billfold, even my purse, even my spending? I can't tell you how many times I've been able to speak to people like this and say, okay, guys, we're going to make some decisions today. And I'm going to say the same thing to you right now. There may be people in this building that you've never given your heart to Jesus. And today you need to do that. See, you can't start making Jesus Lord over every area until first of all you give him your heart. See, you need to give Christ your heart, your life, and say, Lord, I'm tired of living the way I've been living. I'm tired of running the wrong way. God, I want to give you my heart, my life. Just a moment, we're going to invite men to come up here and stand at this altar. They're going to be here to help you make that decision to invite Christ in your heart. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, you know what? I want to be part of a church that teaches me stuff like this. And I want to be a member of Eden Westside. I'd love to have you. If I wasn't a member, I'd join today. And I want you to come and tell one of these guys, hey, I want to become a member of this church. But I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to groups on this subject. And I've said to men, men, Maybe it would be good for you to come down to an altar and put your billfold on the altar and say, God, not, you don't have to leave it, but say, God, I've been ruling over this long enough. I want to surrender my finances to you. I've seen it where women would come down with tears in their eyes, bring their purses and lay it at the altar and say, you know what? I'm going to surrender every buying decision to Christ today. I've seen it where couples, husbands and wives, have joined their hands together and come to the altar just like it was in the first service. In the first service, the altar was filled up with young couples and people that were coming down, bowing their knee at the altar, going, you know what? That pastor just told us the truth. They grabbed their wife by the hand and said, let's go down and kneel, give our finances to God. Let's go down and ask God to help us. Let's go down and ask God to regulate our finances and our decisions. Couples, I encourage you to do that. Men, I encourage you, young men. I know it's weird, guys. I know it's awkward. But I encourage you to start something brand new in your family. Before you go spend this week, grab your wife by the hand. Say, sweetheart, let's pray. Let's pray over our finances. Let's give it to God. We've never done this before, but today we want to join up our hands together. Let's do what Pastor told us to do. 
Let's pray about our finances and let's ask God to help us. Folks, I'm convinced that if you'll do that, God will help you. So right now, I'm going to ask you to stand all over this building today. And as we stand, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. Close your eyes as our ministers come. And today, you may be here and you want to come and pray with one of them. And they'll help you today. Or maybe you want to join the church or whatever your need may be. Why don't you come and give it to Jesus? Or maybe you just need to come and ask God to help you with your marriage and your finances. Or maybe you're single and you say, you know what? I need God to help me. Well, if you'll ask him, he'll help you. Why don't you come right now as we begin to sing? Just make those decisions for the Lord. Grab your friend, grab your wife, grab your husband by the hand. Come on down and pray together. If you're here and you need to make that spiritual, eternal decision, you come right now as we sing together.